Great. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of uh, first start with, for those of you who are watching and want to do some of the hands-on things later on, this would be a good time to launch if you your server. So if you're, it's already started, you can stop it and restart it and that'll pull in the latest set of materials. Uh, so I'm just gonna click start my server and this will launch server and it will start up. And, and while it starts up and gets going, I'm gonna go through uh, how to think about making workflows work for you. If you're doing more work than your workflows, then that's probably not a good thing. So you want your workflows to do more work than you. Uh, so hopefully we can get through to some of the things based on that leads us to NiPipe and an ecosystem that has been created to help do neuroimaging and other analyses. Uh, gee, before I start, you've been pointed to this. Uh, keep posting questions at neurostars.org uh, as they come up, as you work with any of these tools. Uh, that's a general purpose environment in which to freely ask questions and uh, folks from around the world will help answer some of those things. First, a thank you. Over 190 people have contributed to code countless bug reports and questions. So it's, it's not just the code contributors. In addition to the code contributors, we rely heavily on the community to help us improve software. And this is true not just of NiPy, but across the ecosystem of software uh, that we participated in the neuroimaging and the broader neuroscience community. Uh, I also want to thank all the open source projects that we depend on. There are several of them. And without the firm basis on which those were created, it would be hard to build a tool like NiPipe or some of the other tools. Uh, there were a bunch of people who were involved with the creation of NiPipe. It all started at a NiPy workshop at UC Berkeley in 2009 and then evolved into the NiPy project. Uh, and today the engineering core uh, is primarily maintained by Oscar, Chris, Matthias, Dorota, and Michael Notter, who's built on NiPipe tutorial, continues to kind of disseminate the knowledge about how to use NiPipe. There are many derived packages and over the years we have had significant success from various labs that have invested resources themselves in supporting uh, or adding components to NiPipe. And then finally, NiPipe has received funding from various NIH grants and from the INCF. Okay, so I'm hoping that at the end of the next hour and a half to two hours or so, uh, you will have a flavor for why workflow systems are essential for many scientific analysis. Uh, we'll discuss some common concepts across workflow technologies, so not specific to NiPy per se, but I think if you understand workflows in general, you'll be able to switch between things as relevant for your needs and applications. Uh, we'll talk about the NiPy ecosystem and some things you can do with the NiPy ecosystem and how you might be able to help improve scientific workflows. Uh, and while we won't get into some of these things, uh, we will at least allude to, and I'm happy to take Q and A's on designing robust, reproducible and usable workflows. Uh, and along the way, you'll receive random pointers to several things. Uh, not all of them are coherent, but hopefully you can follow up on some of these things later on. However, you will still need to learn a lot of other things. Uh, fundamentals of MRI analysis or how to analyze data in your specific neuroscientific domain. And here are some potential links uh, to some of these things. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list by any means. Uh, there are lots of resources. And in fact, if as a quick project, you even put teaching materials together that could be of use to people, that would be a good hack project to work on at the end of NeuroHack Week. Uh, you still will figure out what software tools exist to solve your problem because every problem is different and not consistent. So that while there are certain tools that are going to help you uh, solve a specific problem, because different problems arrive, you're going to end up using different kinds of software tools for those problems. Uh, the full potential of any of the tools we highlight here, we're going to only going to scratch the surface of uh, some of the tools in the NiPipe ecosystem. And so you, you will have to spend some time after this uh, to our period to dig into the details of some of these things. And you need to figure out how to use your own laptop. Hopefully you can do that. 
or your HPC cluster or cloud resources to do some analysis. And finally, as neuroscience has exploded, there's a significant increase in the amount of data and computational complexity. So learning how to use some of the tools like Data Lad and NeuroDocker to create uh, computational environments and to manage your data are going to be essential for uh, moving to a more efficient and effective space of doing research. So many of us have seen a picture like this. Um, there are many tools out there, and part of it is that uh, there are even different variants of tools. And the reason that exists is because you may have to do something very specific for a very specific question that a general purpose tool may not be able to answer. So understanding and exploring the world of neuroimaging tools is probably going to be useful to a broad set of analysis and future directions of your own research. And it's important to understand how tools behave, but perhaps it's even more important to understand when they break. And so you should continuously use your own tools and others' tools as much as you can. Uh, if you feel like there's not enough time to do it, anytime you try out something, try it out with one or two different things. Uh, it will get you to understand tools better, and it's important to kind of understand when things break. So I have this quote from an article. It's kind of a double uh, quote. So in this passage itself, uh, they quote Niels Bohr, an expert is a person who has found out by his own painful experience all the mistakes that one can make in a very narrow field. And then for Edward Teller himself, uh, Teller succeeds not only by, by the high average level of his ideas, by, but, but by producing them in unparalleled volume, thereby making his mistakes rapidly and becoming more and more expert. And I think this kind of boils down to almost everything we do in science. The more you can try things, especially at least in neuroimaging where you can try a lot of things in a safe computational space, uh, you can try out different kinds of things and they'll tell you how each thing that you're using behaves and how that influences the scientific questions you ask. And that I think becomes a core element of what the Neuro Academy is trying to get at with the different kinds of tools and technologies being presented here. Okay. So now we get down to a workflow. And at the very simple level, we can define a workflow as a set of tasks needed to achieve one or more goals. And here are some generic workflows, whether it's purchasing a car, planning or actually having a wedding, cooking a meal, uh, constructing a house, flying to New Zealand, for example. And if we think about all of these workflows, they all have kind of common pieces to them. Uh, they all require some set of workers that may be an individual or a group of individuals to take some decisions, to uh, take some steps to get to the goal. And the goal may be a singular goal, it, as is the case in this particular case, in most of these cases, or it may be a multiple goal. Cooking a meal means multiple dishes that come out. And so in many of these workflows, a sequence of tasks has to be executed. And that's where kind of the word pipeline becomes almost a synonym for workflows. Uh, and this originates from the industrial automation uh, world where pipelines started achieving efficiency in construction of industrial products, especially cars, where it kind of started. What we talk of most of the time, uh, at least in the computational context though, is more like a data flow. It's a set of tasks that consume or generate data towards achieving one or more goals. Uh, specifically, any of these tasks can get started whenever all the necessary input data is available for the task. And here are some examples of data flows. Uh, analyzing tweets, I was going to say analyzing Tal's tweets, uh, uh, but any tweet would do for now. Uh, uh, building a machine learning model, uh, doing data wrangling and quality control, uh, running a neuroimaging analysis. So in general, a lot of these data flows involve inputs of various kinds, they produce outputs, and those outputs themselves go into different kinds of tasks. So a data flow 
can be represented often as a computational graph where data flows from nodes to other nodes. And that's really the construct you're thinking about, is how do I get data to flow from one node to another node when you're thinking about a workflow? So what does a data flow essentially provide? Separation of data, scripts, and execution. Uh, data flows should not be, I'm not going to say they are not, uh, but should not be intricately tied to a particular data set. They should be reusable, uh, such using abstractions, such that they work with different data sets. Uh, data flows often do not require human intervention, although you can think of data flows, for example, for those of you who do free surfer uh, reconstruction, often you end up going and editing, and that's human intervention. Uh, but part of the goal is to understand some of these things and turn them into more automated execution. Standardization. Because you want to apply the same data flow to similar data, it encourages standardization. So if you get your data into a bid standard, the same data flow that has been created for one bids data set is likely to work on another bids data set that have the same kind of data in it. Uh, data management. So most data flow frameworks rely on language abstractions to support flow of data. If you were writing a script, you would be writing how to name your files at the end of each step. Uh, and data flow systems kind of take that over from you in most cases. And so you don't have to write as complex a script in creating a data flow as you might do if you were doing things outside of a data flow framework. So why use data flows? Uh, most neuroscience analysis comprise multiple steps that are dependent on prior things. I, the same thing, the computational graph. Uh, these, for example, in neuroimaging, we may have pre-processing, quality control, normalization of data to a common reference space, and then statistical inference in that space. You may also have data flows like machine learning, right? So all of these things require different stages of data, and using data flows might make that process a little more efficient. The other thing that comes across is that many software implement these uh, algorithms. And you might want to consider what to use depending on the goals of your application. Uh, for example, the algorithms may vary in the execution time and output quality as a function of sample characteristics. So something that works on adults may not work on infants. Uh, something that works in humans may not work on macaques. Uh, something that works on in vivo data may not work on ex vivo data. Uh, the data quality itself plays a role in how you use these tools. So some tools are quite sensitive to the data quality that comes into it. And then finally, you may not be able to run some of these tools depending on what kind of computational environment you're operating in. So all of these things uh, need to be taken into account uh, and need to be used in the construction of a data flow that matches your use cases. Uh, matchmaking. So for any given application, each software brings with it a set of strengths and weaknesses. And you'll have to understand what those are to understand what to use in a given application. So where do data flows become useful? Uh, well, I would say one of the first things is abstraction. Uh, because you're encapsulating the different kinds of functional tasks and that you're doing, the tasks that you would need to transform and process the data, uh, that provides an abstraction to how you represent the plan of action. Uh, each data flow also, each task in a data flow can often simplify the assumptions. So this is similar to the data management thing. If you were writing your own script, you'd be writing file names all over the place in order to manage how things are created. Uh, in a data flow framework, uh, you can simplify that assumption and focus on what the task actually does rather than thinking about how it names things. Efficiency, because it's a computational graph, uh, you can construct it to perform parallelization of various processes. Uh, you can reduce overhead of data management. Uh, and at the same time, you gain replicability because you have kind of represented something as a computational process. Perhaps one of the things that is most important in a data flow is that it gets to embed knowledge inside that construct, right? Uh, 
if we look at something like fMRI prep, it embeds best practices uh, in how to uh, analyze, or I should say analyze, pre-process fMRI data. Uh, in some cases, it puts heuristics into play and these get encoded. So that's another way of embedding knowledge into something that this data flow works for this scenario through these heuristics. Uh, and it provides a structured plan for analysis. Uh, so this should be good for pre-registrations. As you think about what analysis you should be doing uh, for a specific experiment, uh, people are going and registering some of these things. And so having a data flow provides a very explicit way of saying, if I got this data, I can run it through this data flow and look at the output. And that embeds in it all the decision choices, all the parameters that you need to use in the data flow itself. Um, so this would be super useful for clinical trials or things like that where you have to establish ahead of time what steps you will take to analyze the data. So as we talk about data flows, this question comes up over and over again, should I always use data flows? And I don't myself use data flows all the time. Uh, you have to think about your goals and your use cases. Uh, if I want to share a script that works efficiently in multiple contexts, I might construct a data flow. But if the script itself is very trivial, perhaps just a simple well-encoded Python function is sufficient. Uh, so it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, I think complexity of your analysis or your steps is an important construct in, the, in how you might use data flows. What are your computational dependencies? Uh, if I'm running on my HPC cluster, that's very different from running on my laptop. Uh, so you have to take into account are these data flows going to require certain constructs and that does the data flow or workflow system support some of those execution constructs uh, before you write a data flow. How are you managing data? How do you parameterize the script? So all of these things would come up not just in the context of a data flow, but in the context of any general script that you write. And so you have to take those considerations into account in constructing data flows. How specific is the code that you're writing to one situation? Uh, I've myself written several scripts over uh, my analysis lifetime that would not run on anything uh, other than the specific thing that it was created for. That's probably not a good thing. A uh, little generalization can often help because you get to reuse the script in other situations. We often do that by copying a script, changing certain things, and rerunning that script on that new situation. So thinking a little bit ahead of time in terms of how you might generalize can actually help reusability of many of your things. And that's gonna be the same for data flows as well. Uh, will you share and support your code? Uh, part of the reason of abstracting away to data flows is to provide that abstraction where somebody else can take it and run it on some of their own data sets. Uh, so making it available in a form, and this is not, again, true not just of data flows, but of general scripts as well, is how you will share and if you will support your code. Uh, so the more uh, constrained you can make it, the easier it may be to support some of the things that you do. The computational resources you have access to uh, will tell you whether you should use data flows or not. So for example, if you're analyzing the ABCD data set on your laptop, uh, you, unless you have a really fancy laptop with significant numbers of cores and memory, uh, using data flows may not be as helpful in that context. Uh, but if you're analyzing things on a HPC cluster or in the cloud, uh, at that scale of data, data flows might become essential in that context to use. So workflow systems provide computational flexibility, but unfortunately they have a steep cost. Uh, it can increase the complexity and brittleness of your environments. Because you can mix and mac, uh, match things that you need, uh, you might rely on things that increases the complexity of your computational environment. You have to learn more on how to combine soft tools from different software packages. Uh, you cannot just point and click. Uh, you need to script and program your analysis. And debugging is not always easy. So these are things that you have to kind of 
take into account as you work with various workflow systems. And this is not just uh, specific to NiPipe, each workflow system has its own way of thinking about it. Uh, the debugging part uh, reminds me of a, a statement from one a bioinformatician uh, who was analyzing uh, genetic data at, at a large scale and uh, was using a Spark system to do it. And I said, so how do you handle errors? And uh, the response was, well, we just throw out the samples that errored and just can redo the analysis with the samples that didn't. And so depending on your needs, again, and your scale of data that you have access to, different things might work well or not well uh, for your analysis. And that's something to keep in mind. But despite these uh, costs, there are significant benefits. You can reuse existing workflows uh, and you can reuse them on multiple platforms often. They abstract away uh, some of the details of execution away from the user. Uh, you can combine the most appropriate algorithms for the goal. So, and your goals may be different. You may want something fast in a certain situation or accurate in a, some other situation. Uh, whereas in other cases, you might just want it on average to be robust, that it does not break. So these things require you to construct data flows that have different characteristics. And once you know how to construct a data flow, you can create others. Uh, it's really the conceptual pieces are quite similar across these different data flow systems. So there are many workflow systems out there. Uh, in, in this uh, tutorial, we'll cover a little bit of NiPipe and Pydra, uh, but SnakeMake and Nextflow are two other data flow systems out there. And if you wanted a full list of things, you can go to the awesome pipelines uh, uh, repo. And there's a link uh, in this document that takes you there that lists all possible data flow systems. The problem is that once you get there, you'll see over a hundred plus data flow systems out there. So you might want to consider different features that come along with these different data flow systems. For example, what are you writing your data flow in? Uh, is it using a domain specific language, a DSL, or is it using a more standard language like Python? And that may play a role depending on what you want to do with the data flow. Uh, does it provide nested workflow support? So across one of the things that we have seen as we have developed NiPipe is that very few systems actually go to provide a deep level of nesting of workflows. And that's something quite common as you think about functional programming or programming in general. You reuse abstractions at different levels. You'd use libraries and functions. Data flows as computational graphs should be no different. Does it provide a workflow or a task library uh, that you can reuse instead of creating things for, from scratch? Uh, that, uh, now, there are many of these workflow systems that provide different kinds of workflows and tasks, uh, but they might be specific to certain domains. And that might uh, kind of tilt your direction towards choosing one system versus another because they don't exist, uh, because the same tasks don't exist in other workflow systems. Uh, caching support. As you get to larger and larger uh, data sets and more time-consuming analysis, uh, sometimes being able to cache uh, your execution is, uh, is going to be important in terms of how quickly you can run an analysis or rerun changes in an analysis. Uh, so caching support is, again, something a feature to consider and most of these data flow systems provide some level of caching uh, for the user. Execution support. How does the data flow system parallelize? Uh, do they have a re uh, execution manager that uh, deals with uh, the execution or do you have to code it yourself? Uh, do they have support for container operations? Um, do they allow you to kind of engage different types of hardware in the resources that you have access to. So these days we've moved a lot of our computation in certain areas to GPU based uh, processes. So can you easily get access to uh, executing your data on GPU based systems and flexibly mix and match CPU based and GPU based computing? Uh, 
And finally, uh, I think this is true of almost all of the data flow systems I've listed here, uh, provenance tracking. So the data flow itself is a plan. It's a specification of what you want the system to do. Provenance is what the system actually did. And sometimes you get to see bugs in the uh, underlying uh, analysis by looking at what the system did rather than what you asked it to do. There are also uh, several efforts in trying to create an abstraction away from a specific language like Python or R or MATLAB to a more common uh, language uh, that's agnostic of the implementation uh, environment. And so here are a couple of things. So common workflow language, the workflow description language, and the next flow domain specific language are all kind of custom ways of describing workflows and data flows. And something you might want to consider looking into if you want to create generic things that could be really executed as long as the execution supports that kind of language. Uh, to us, Python is as good a language in that context where uh, it's a simple scripting language. It allows uh, quite a generic flexibility of representation of objects and you can execute it in almost any environment. So uh, we have chosen to use Python as a way of describing our workflow systems, but others have kind of abstracted it away from even app uh, to a more uh, rigid uh, construct. So that brings me a little bit to the story of Nightpipe. Uh, Nightpipe was started to kind of bring the world of neuroimaging tools together. Uh, so we wanted to know what was out there uh, and could we bring it uh, together and use it in a consistent uh, manner. So any tool, any neuroimaging tool that was out there, uh, can we represent it in such a way such that in Python, we can call it and use it in a consistent manner. We also wanted to understand how these different tools that were out there behaved. Uh, you may have to learn different ways of using a given tool. Uh, could we simplify that? Uh, and finally, which ones to use? Um, and while NiPipe can help answer this, it doesn't do so directly. It enables uh, the process by which you can start comparing uh, the tools. So the other piece to NiPipe, uh, so step one was library. The step two was kind of combining these uh, tools together. So you could when we started NiPipe, uh, the world of computing was quite different than it is today. Uh, we had various workstations in the lab that were hooked up over SSH and we were using IPython parallel uh, execution to recruit resources from each other's desktops uh, to run things because we did not have access to an HPC cluster. Uh, so part of it was how do you execute workflows? DOSC was not even, I think, a concept at that point in time. Uh, we were using a hack to try and get resources together to execute workflows on larger and larger data sets. Uh, it then changed into running things on HPC clusters and provides much more extensive support uh, for more standard resource managers today. Uh, we also wanted to compare tools. Uh, one way of comparing whether one piece of uh, skull stripping does uh, perform similarly to another piece of skull stripping uh, in another package is to run them in parallel on the same data. And NiPipe allows you to very easily kind of put those things together to compare tools. It also allows you to combine the best tools. And I put best in double quotes because I don't know a good answer to what best means today. There are many ways of looking at best. Uh, and in fact, it may not even be the right question to answer ask. Uh, and especially as you combine these tools, does the combination help? And you'll hear a lot more about this from Oscar in the next section. Um, but again, NiPipe can help answer this question, but doesn't do so directly. That's still a scientific and an open question in terms of how does the combination of some of these tools help in certain specific analysis situations? So NiPipe 1 uh, provides Pythonic interfaces to over 700 neuroimaging tools, including support for MATLAB-based tools like SPM. Uh, it comes with a generic workflow engine with special semantics and has extensive support for local and HPC workflows. Uh, 
You can do local resource management across parallel costs. Uh, it will schedule things as cores become available and memory becomes available. It can also do that similarly for remote parallel HPC uh, distribution with monitoring of the execution. Uh, I won't go into each of these uh, packages, but there are several NiPy-based uh, derivative packages that have been created for different kinds of analysis. You will hear about NiPreps in the next section, uh, but you can take a look at each of these things which serve different specialized needs. So what does NiPipe do and not do? NiPipe does not create workflows for you, not yet. Uh, maybe Tal is working on a GPT implementation where you just talk to GPT and it will generate NiPipe workflows, but that does not exist yet. Uh, if any of you are interested in turning GPT into a NiPipe workflow or data flow producer, uh, that would be a fantastic contribution, uh, but NiPipe does not do that right now. NiPipe also does not optimize workflows for you in a generic scientific context, as in figure out the best way to analyze a certain piece of data. What it does is it optimizes the execution of a workflow or a data flow that you have created. NiPipe does allow you to create scalable complex workflows because it supports nested hierarchical uh, constructs. Uh, you can get to uh, fairly complex workflows. And unfortunately, I think the field of neuroimaging still has a lot of complexity in how we pre-process different kinds of data. And uh, as we get new instruments and tools coming online, uh, it might become absolutely essential for you to mix and match different kinds of software. Uh, but having the same Pythonic interface, again, helps how you do that. To use NiPipe workflows, you need to know minimal Python and shell. So I wanted to create a distinction between using NiPipe workflows that somebody else creates versus creating NiPipe workflows. Uh, I think the learning curve is much uh, uh, steeper for the second. So to create NiPipe workflows, you not only need to know Python, you need to know NiPipe semantics and at least one neuroimaging package, hopefully more. Uh, but you at least need to know how the tools in a given neuroimaging package behave. So overall, NiPipe has three different components. Uh, as I mentioned, a uniform Python API to various different neuroimaging tools. Uh, SPM, FSL, and FreeSurf are listed here, uh, but it covers uh, a significant array of other tools as well. Uh, it comes with a workflow engine that allows you to nest workflows and workflows themselves. Uh, and because it's a graph and everything is represented as a graph, you get parallelization and efficiency of execution by simple analysis of the structure of the workflow. And it supports various execution plugins. Uh, it can do local execution as well as various HPC resource-based execution. But NiPipe is transitioning. So NiPy 1.x is the current stable platform. And I would recommend anybody who's starting right now who wants to get started right away with neuroimaging analysis to use NiPy 1.x. NiPy 2.0 is a new ecosystem of tools. And it involves a general purpose workflow engine we call Pydra. Uh, and we'll go through some exercises today to introduce you to Pydra. Uh, NeuroDocker, which is a neuroscience uh, container builder. Uh, it simplifies container construction and allows you to create containers containing various neuroimaging tools. Again, all of these are open source projects and we welcome contributions to improve any of these tools. And contributions to improve is uh, even submitting bugs and posting feature requests is a contribution to help improve these tools. Uh, Test Cracking is a tool built on Pydra and NeuroDocker to provide a parametric or a vibration testing framework. It uses, uh, it generates different kinds of containers with different kinds of environments and runs Pydra workflows uh, to evaluate certain scripts in these different environments and it'll tell you if your script is sensitive to changes in environments. The same thing could be used to look at sensitivity of scripts to algorithmic and parametric changes within the script itself. Uh, NiPreps, you'll hear a lot about it in the, in the upcoming tutorial from Oscar, but it's a collection of different uh, types of pre-processing workflows uh, that are useful for various different domains of neuroimaging. NiFlows kind of is a more general purpose data flow repository that you are working together. Uh, 
to try and create a place where we can collate and disseminate uh, community constructed workflows of different kinds. Uh, not just pre-processing workflows, but general purpose uh, workflows that span all different aspects of neuroscience and neuroimaging. And then finally, a project that's uh, about to get started uh, is NoBrainer, which is, a, again, a community supported resource for uh, deep learning models and a framework for creating deep learning models uh, for various neuroimaging analyses. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little bit into PyDRA. Uh, and then right after the next two slides, I think we'll take a break and then uh, switch over to the Jupyter section. So PyDRA features composable data flows. Uh, so just like we said, they're nesting in NiPipe, PyDRA kind of uh, also supports it. The big difference is that a workflow becomes a first class object in uh, PyDRA and behaves like a task or a node in the workflow itself, uh, which means uh, it has support for caching. So if you have a complex workflow that takes hours to run, if none of the inputs or the graph structure of the workflow itself has changed, you can rerun the workflow uh, by simply reloading its cache. Uh, it extends the semantics for looping over input sets. And uh, I will go into details of this a little more as we walk through the Jupyter tutorial. Uh, it provides a con content addressable global cache. So you can have multiple cache locations. So imagine multiple people in a lab are working on the same data set and often running the same kinds of processes you could have a common set of caches that each person writes to, writes to and reuses each other's execution outputs if the inputs to those executions uh, have not changed. And so you uh, get a writable uh, cache that you, are, you can write to, but you can get read-only caches for all the things that other people are uh, generating. So that allows a very flexible way when you have multiple people analyzing the same data in a group uh, or in a specific hackathon or project setting. Uh, support for Python functions. So you can take arbitrary Python functions and turn them into uh, PyDRA tasks, uh, as well as external shell commands. So you can run uh, different shell uh, tools through PyDRA. Uh, it has built-in native container execution support. So you can take a shell command and say, run this inside this container or you can explicitly create a container task. Uh, this is something that NiPipe does not have. Uh, you can hack around it in NiPipe to execute something in a container, uh, but PyDRA kind of made this uh, an operational characteristics of the language itself or, or of the semantics of PyDRA. And it has auditing and provenance information. And if you wanted to go, go into details of some of these features, uh, there's a PyDRA paper that describes these things. So this is the time when we can uh, switch over. So what I'll do is I'll take a break for five minutes. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll, I'll monitor those and start answering those questions. And then we can jump into the minimal tutorial for this. However, there is a full extensive NiPipe and PyDRA tutorial that's available. Uh, and both are available via my binder. So uh, for those who are following up on this, I would highly encourage you, if you're using NiPipe, go through the NiPipe tutorial. It's going to take you a couple of days to go through, but it would be worth it because it'll make your life much simpler in terms of uh, both constructing, using, and debugging NiPipe workflows. Uh, the PyDRA project, is a little more nascent. Uh, so the PyDRA tutorial is not as extensive as the NiPipe tutorial. Uh, but as we build a project, you can already start using PyDRA in different contexts and we'll go through some of the pieces today to give you a better sense of what PyDRA does. So I'm going to uh, say we take a five minute break here uh, and switch over to the Jupyter Hub and I'll take a look at questions in the meantime. Doctor, there's a, there's a question on Slack. Uh, how is caching handled in PyDRA? I don't know if you want to answer that now or defer it. Uh, so we will be going through um, the caching process, uh, but effectively every task creates a, a folder that's based on its input checksum. 
and uh, stores the result of the task inside that folder. So that's how caching is done on disk. Uh, and then the cache is reused if some of the task or some of the place uh, wants to call that task with the same set of inputs. I have a question. What's the uh, what's the what's the sort of timeline you project for adoption of Pydra? Like, when do you think you'll sort of be, the community should switch over as a whole? I would say end of this year is a reasonable timeline, and for a couple of reasons. One is uh, Chris, who's talking in the other session, has just created a Pydra tasks uh, repo that allows people to reuse any of the NiPipe interfaces through PyDRA. So that will allow some level of construction of workflows in using the NiPipe interfaces. What we're moving to is having PyDRA tasks for each package be its own separate repo. And part of the reason we're going to that is uh, maintaining these interfaces and workflows has become really tough on the NiPipe uh, core team. Uh, we no longer necessarily have the expertise across all the packages. Uh, and as packages changes, uh, we want the community to kind of uh, maintain uh, certain packages that they have more expertise in. Uh, certain things that were introduced as interfaces to NiPipe uh, have not been maintained over multiple years. And so we wanted a way to notify users when a particular package or interface was maintained. Uh, so as we transition those packages over to their own uh, repos, uh, we should be able to, at that point in time, start automatically converting NiPipe 1 workflows to PyDRA-based workflows. Uh, and that, to me, is an end-of-the-year kind of target. Great. Um, there's one question in the Q&A. And also, uh, another thing, just maybe before you start in this part, uh, if you show people how you actually open the, uh, the, the terminal there. Oh, sure. Uh, I can do that. Unfortunately, if I'm in full screen, I can't see the Q&A. So uh, if you use a mix of custom code in a language other than Python and major imaging platforms, can the workflow still be created using NiPipe? Yes. Uh, so that's, in fact, one of the strengths of NiPipe. Uh, you can have, uh, you can execute shell scripts, uh, you can execute uh, actual interfaces. Uh, and as we go through the tutorial, one of the things I will show you is what we call a function node in NiPipe. Uh, and uh, the function node in NiPipe uh, allows you to basically call arbitrary, do arbitrary things with Python, which means if you had even if this, then that to make your coffee machine start, you could do so. Uh, so yes, uh, you can have a mix of arbitrary kinds of things with NiPipe. All right, so uh, I'm gonna close this out. If you've started your uh, Jupyter Hub, uh, you would essentially get to see this launcher. If you don't get to see the launcher, you can always go to this icon on the left. Uh, let me just pull this back to full screen. This icon on the left, if you click on it, it says launcher. Um, And within the launcher, you can click on terminal. If I need to get another launcher, I go back to that icon. Uh, not that icon, hold on one second. New launcher. And I can create new notebooks or get another terminal if I wanted to. So for this tutorial, uh, so I'm gonna start navigating from the beginning you would have entered in, in this space, if you restarted, uh, we would go into curriculum. And then in curriculum, uh, there is a Wednesday workflows folder, and that's what we are gonna go into. And technically the presentation I'm giving is in this folder itself. So you can take a look at it later on. 
but we are going to focus on a couple of brief tutorials for Nypipe and Pydra in this. And I'm going to start with Nypipe and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through the Pydra constructs. Pydra is new, but we think it's quite powerful and it already helps in a lot of, in a bunch of different uh, tasks we are doing with it. Uh, so while it may not have all the neuroimaging tools immediately available, uh, it might help you do certain other types of workflows and analyses pretty efficiently. Okay. Is there... Um, okay, so let's go to the NiPipe folder. And I'll go back to full screen mode. And let's, uh, and I'm gonna click on this introduction, uh, quick start. And as you'll notice, the name of this thing says, this is a very quick uh, non-neuroimaging introduction to NiPipe workflows. <laughs> Uh, and there are two reasons for this. Uh, one is that the current Jupyter Hub that you're working on uh, does not have a lot of the neuroimaging tools installed uh, like FSL or FreeSurfer. Uh, but to understand the conceptual pieces of NiPipe, we don't need those tools. Uh, I will show you uh, through the binder interface uh, how you can get to and look at all the other kinds of tools and the binder link that I provided for the a full extensive NiPipe tutorial does have access to FSL, SPM, AFNI, and ANS uh, in that container that you can use. Okay, so the first thing we'll try and do is kind of, we'll, we'll walk through this code a little bit uh, as we discuss different components of this. Now, semantically, there are three distinct pieces to almost any workflow system. A set of tasks, a workflow engine, and how the workflow executes on some resource. Obviously, in this case, we're going to execute it locally uh, in this uh, pod uh, in, in the hub. Uh, we are not connecting to a remote worker. And the other thing is, where does it get data from? So our current examples will not involve any neuroimaging data. We're simply going to use Python functions to illustrate different components of workflows. Okay. So uh, the first thing we do is import a few things from uh, NiPipe, a workflow node and a function. Uh, and so as you can see over here, uh, we define just a generic function, sum. Uh, we can construct a workflow, give it a name. Uh, so everything in NiPipe needs to have names. And the part of the reason things need to have names is because you have to refer to them both from the Python side as well as inside the workflow side. Uh, and names help with uh, describing things or addressing things later on. So here we're adding, a, we're creating a single node called adder. And the reason we're using node over here, as opposed to just calling the function interface, is that node is what adds uh, the ability to take a NiPipe interface and put it into a workflow. And it pulls in all kinds of features. So as an example, uh, for those of you who may be familiar with FSL, uh, if you run something like BET, which is a skull stripping tool on an input, FSL will create the output in the location where the input was. In a workflow context, we want some isolation. We want these outputs to be created in the workflows, tasks, local cache directory. And so those are the kinds of things that Node adds on top of just executing the interface uh, to create a cache directory, to pull in the relevant pieces so that when BET executes, it creates its outputs within that directory and then picks those up and passes them on to the next uh, node in the workflow. So we've, we've created a node. Uh, we are setting these two inputs for the node and we can add the nodes to the workflow and run it. 
So when we do that, uh, we get an output from NiPipe, which tells you that it's setting up uh, this A plus B node, as you can see from the name of the node uh, for this workflow, which is called the hello workflow. Um, and it runs it and it says, finish running hello A plus B. Now we will add a second node. Uh, so we will take the outputs uh, or we will take a node. All it does is it runs uh, and concatenates the inputs given to it. So none of these are constructive neuroimaging things, but they should help explain how we are conceptually connecting pieces in a workflow. And the key here is this line uh, wf.connect, which basically says, I'm going to take the sum output. So if I look at uh, this workflow, uh, the earlier function that I put in, uh, the adder function, I'm saying that the inputs to this function have names A and B, and the output has names sum. In this connect thing, I'm saying, I'm gonna take this output name sum and pass it onto the input named A in the concatenator function. And the concatenator function itself has an output name named sum list. So let's run this. And when it does this, uh, let's take a look at a few things. Uh, one, it checks whenever it runs, whether there is a cache uh, available. And if not, it will rerun it. Uh, if it's available, it'll just use it. So in this case, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it ran, it ran both of the elements And at the end of the day, we can check the outputs. So a few more things to look at over here. When we call wf.run, it creates an execution graph as its output. And we can look at the nodes in the execution graph. So hello, a plus b is node one and concatenate a and b is node two. We're simply using a Python syntax in this next case to show us the outputs of this second node. And, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you can see that the result, the outputs has again this named output called sum list, which has the outputs four comma three, which is what we would expect if we took the inputs of A and B uh, one and three, that would have been added by the adder. We would have gotten a sum of four we are sending the sum of four into concatenator into the A, and so that would have been four, and we are setting the input B, which is three, to do this. Okay. So we're gonna add one more note to this. We're gonna take the output of uh, concat, which is a list, and add one to it. And let's see what happens. It runs and then it gives an error. And that's because in Python, you cannot add a list to a number. Okay, so this introduces the notion that NiPy constructs errors. And you can see in the output of the workflow that it created something called a crash file. Now we can go to the terminal and look at this crash file, but instead we are just going to use Jupyter directly uh, to execute a command line tool called NiPipe CLI uh, to introspect this crash file. And the NiPipe CLI has a subcommand crash, and when we execute it, it will tell us that, hey, this node took as inputs A, 4 comma 3, uh, and it gave the Python error, which is it can only concatenate list, not int. The advantage of having this crash file in NiPipe is that you could run this uh, separately to debug that specific function that crashed. So often you have a complex workflow and there are certain things that crash. And the NiPipe CLI allows you to debug that specific thing that crashed instead of rerunning the entire workflow 
to try and see how to resolve that crash. And that's a useful thing to kind of keep in mind as you debug NiPipe workflows. Uh, the crash setting has two possibilities. You can set the crash file to dump this pickle file, uh, which can be useful for introspective debugging within a Python uh, terminal, but it can also save it as a text file. And sometimes just the text file for this particular error, for example, if I saw this, I would know how to fix this uh, without having to rerun it in an interactive Python terminal. Uh, many of the current uh, workflows out there use the text file uh, for the crash reporting, but there's NiPipe has a configuration system which you can use to override uh, the text file to generate the pickle file if you want to debug some of the complex, work, complex workflows or errors within the complex workflows that are out there. So now let me introduce uh, a second concept. So we saw that the error that we were getting is trying to add one to a list of numbers. Now, scientifically, in this case, I wanted to add one to each of the numbers. And this is where the construct of a map node comes in in NiPipe. What that allows is to say, I'm going to iterate over the list of things that this input has, and I'm going to do things with it. So. All we're doing here is instead of having a node, we are changing this to a map node, and we are adding this construct called an iter field, which says, what are you giving to me as A? I want to treat it as a list, and I'm going to iterate over it. And so we are now doing the exact same thing. We have the adder node, we have the concatter node, uh, but now we are connecting it to this plus one node, which is a map node instead of a regular node. And if we run this, it will run and create an output um, that does the right thing. So it took four and three and added one to each of those elements and gave you back an output five comma four. Okay, so that's one way of doing iteration. And the key for a map node in NiPipe is that you can do this on dynamically generated objects. But sometimes you already know ahead of time uh, what objects you want to parallelize over. So a common example is something like subjects uh, or a set of templates in neuroimaging that you might want to register to. And those are things that you can specify ahead of time. And for that in NiPipe, the construct is uh, iterables. So we are going to take the first node that we had, adder, and say that the input A, uh, I want to iterate over two values, one and two. I keep input B fixed and I will run this. And the best way to look at this is to kind of look at it from the perspective of the graph that NiPipe generates. So we're going to use some NiPipe constructs uh, to generate the graph. Again, all of this is covered in detail in the tutorial. The basic graph looks like this, which simply says I have uh, three uh, nodes in sequence, A plus B, concate and B, and add one. But when we look at it as an expanded graph in terms of what it actually executed, we see that it ran two parallel streams over the two inputs of A that we had provided in here through this iterables command, right? So with iterables, we are saying run over both of these values of A and it runs the entire subgraph of A plus B over those two values. So that's why you get two chains of output in the execution graph. Now this is where the strength of NiPipe comes in. We can add iterables for any sets of parameters anywhere in the graph. So if you're doing neuroimaging, you could have iterables over subjects. If you wanted to sweep across a set of smoothness values or smoothness kernels, you could have a set of iterables over that. So we're going to mimic that scenario over here, pretending A was our subjects. We're going to, for concatter, also iterate over a couple of values of the parameter B. And it will execute, giving you a lot of information. And now we can look at the execution graph of this. And now you can see 
that each branch, which was a equal to one and a equal to two, now has two sub branches for concatenation because we are asking concat to iterate over different values as well. So this is how you get nested for loops in NiPy without actually trying to code data flow management through each of the nested steps. NiPy handles all the internal naming and other things for you as you do these nested steps. And nesting or for loops over certain parameters are very common in all kinds of neuroscience uh, applications. So now that you've split things up, there's a way to kind of pull things back together. And in NiPipe, that construct is called the join node. Uh, it allows us to merge results back together. So we can uh, add a new node, which is merge and scale data. It brings the data back together. It scales it. Again, the functions here are quite arbitrary. The key is that we are using this join node construct and saying that our source for the iterables is coming from the adder node and the join field is the data to field that this join node has as input. So it will try to take the splits that happened with adder and try to pull it back with data to in the join field. And if I generates a lot of outputs, so let's check the outputs again. The basic execution graph now still has just a linear sequence of four nodes. But if we look at the full execution graph, you will see that while it's splitting things out, it's joining things back together under the execution graph into two pieces. So now we've allowed people to split with iterables and join things back uh, later on in the process. So this can be quite helpful when you're splitting across subjects or smoothing kernels and you want to do something by combining those elements back together. And that's where a join node comes in. Uh, the final thing I want to show over here is execution time of these workflows. So if I run this workflow and I'm gonna use nprox equal to two, it, it says I have I'm basically reading everything from a cached state. So I'm not actually executing any of these uh, workflows pieces together because what NiPipe does under the hood is it takes a workflow, it expands it out into this execution graph and executes each of the individual tasks. If the inputs to that task hasn't changed, the cache will not have changed and it will regenerate the output from the result that's stored there. But if we change the base directory where the execution is happening and rerun it, it will now say, I'm gonna rerun every single thing. So unlike this previous thing where it said cached, it's basically picking up the cached results from each of uh, the tasks. Here you can actually see it rerunning. So simply by pointing it to a different location, I force it to rerun. There are other ways of forcing it to rerun. Uh, but this tells you that the working directory in NiPipe is where the cache is stored. And that becomes an important thing for you to kind of consider as you uh, do your analysis. Uh, often for different kinds of uh, tasks, we will not uh, keep the working directory. So we will keep the working directory while we are debugging things. But once a workflow is ready to run and we are fairly confident of it, we kind of run it and remove the working directory from uh, execution. Okay, uh, in the full tutorial, this kind of goes into additional exercises that you can do. And I welcome you to kind of go to the binder site and do those additional executions. In the meantime, what we'll do is we'll kind of uh, switch gears a little bit and look at another tutorial in NiPy, which is the basic function interface. Uh, Satra, it's probably a good time to take uh, questions. There's three short ones. Okay. You... Take a look. Great. All right. Uh, does installing the NiPy Python package automatically install the NiPy CLI? Uh, yes. So when you install NiPy, it comes with the NiPy CLI. So if you do pip install NiPy, you will right after that be able to look at the NiPy CLI. 
how does NiPipe CLI differ from the older NiPipe display crash? Uh, I don't know a good answer. I don't know a specific answer to that. So NiPipe CLI is the evolution of NiPipe display crash. So in NiPipe CLI, we have a couple of uh, tools that exist. So let me go into the terminal and type NiPipe CLI. So NiPipe CLI allows uh, different operations on it, whereas NiPipe Display Crash was the set of functionality that existed only within what NiPipe CLI calls the crash subcommand. Can you make conditional branches in a workflow where depending on the output, the output is routed to a different processing step? Or do you need to construct an entirely different workflow? So there is no direct support for conditional branching in NiPipe, and I will foreshadow right now in Pydra. That's planned for Pydra, but it doesn't exist. The way we deal with conditional branches is through what I will show you next, which is the function interface. So since you can construct a workflow inside a function, you can use the function interface to evaluate your condition and execute the branching that happens. Uh, the other piece that we do often in NiPipe is uh, let a branch crash and fail. So you could construct, uh, if you knew what the two conditions were, and sometimes they were dependent on one versus the other, uh, you can use an iterable to do some of those conditions, but that's a very specific scenario of conditioning in NiPipe. The more general option I would say is to use a function node, which is what I would describe next. Uh, so in the past, uh, for various conditional things, uh, we have constructed different workflows and executed the first workflow and then connected up uh, the output of that first workflow to a different workflow depending on conditions of evaluating. I would say this depends on what condition you're evaluating and how uh, complex the conditioning branches are. There are some examples in NiPipe, uh, and I'll take an example of fMRI preprocessing, where in FSL, when you run feed preprocessing, there's a step. Uh, a slightly complex step uh, that involves the Susan command for smoothing the image. And if your smoothing kernel is less than 10% uh, of uh, the voxel size of your input image, FSL actually smooths it with the voxel size of your input image. So we wanted to compare workflows where we wanted to give it zero smoothing versus some smoothing. And so zero would not work because it would always come out with full smoothing. So in that workflow, we created uh, a special branch that looks at the value of uh, the smoothing kernel. And if it's small, it just acts as a pass through operation rather than uh, creating, uh, going through the Susan's process. So if it was less than 10% of the voxel size, the smoothing kernel that was asked for, it would simply pass through the data onto the next step. So we have implemented some of this thing, but uh, those are all kind of specific constructs. There is no generic support for conditioning in NiPipe or Pydra. All right. Uh, okay, so going back to the function interface, this should be a quick one to go through. You've already seen some examples of this in the quick start. Here I'm creating a simple function, which is adding two to an input. Uh, as before, I can uh, construct a node. And this is probably something you did not see in the initial construct is that I can run this node by itself. It will run in some temporary location, but a uh, node in NiPipe is itself an executable and cacheable thing, and you can call it and run it. So this allows you to use uh, nodes in a Python script without even thinking about a data flow. Uh, so if you are maintaining certain things, you can reuse an interface from NiPipe very easily in a Python script. So assuming that if you add two to four, you get six, uh, at least in a deterministic world, uh, 
we can then change uh, and create a new function, add uh, the input name to x underscore bar input, and then add two over here you can see that I did not have to specify the input names. So in the earlier days of NiPipe, when we created the function node, you had to explicitly set the input names. In later editions, when you add a function node, NiPipe will infer the input names from the function signature. So this. You can also use external packages in function nodes. So here's an example uh, where we will try, where we have a function that imports nibabel and loads in a file. We're not actually going to execute the function, uh, but the key here is when you define a function, its imports have to be defined inside it because this function might get shipped over to another computer to execute and it won't know the namespace of the shell or the terminal where you're executing the script. So this is a little detail, but it's important to keep in mind as you define functions in NiPy. Uh, so the next example kind of goes through this uh, and says that NiPy, these functions are closed environments and you have to be able to define the inputs inside the function for it to work. So as an example, uh, the difference here is that here we are importing random from numpy within the function. And in the second scenario, we are leaving numpy.random outside of the function object. And the first one will run and the second one will error because it will say random is not defined. It does not know where to get random from in this particular context. So some of these things are improved in PyDRA, uh, but this was just a quick intro to kind of the concepts of NiPy, how you do iterables, how you do map node, how you do join node, uh, how you construct a workflow. And then you can reuse this in all kinds of settings by going through the full tutorial on Binder. So I'm going to switch out from NiPy into the Hydra world and hopefully as I said earlier, that different workflow systems are similar. You should be able to start seeing some of the similarities between PyDRA and NiPipe in terms of the workflow constructs as we go through the PyDRA tutorial. Uh, I'm going to only go through uh, a couple of pieces of this. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the details. Again, you can go through the full set of tutorials uh, on the binder on PyDRA that I pointed to earlier. Let's look at PyDRA. Uh, for those of you who use Jupyter Notebooks, uh, you know, when you have to put matplotlib plots, you have to say person matplotlib in line. PyDRA uses a certain Python uh, three feature called AsyncIO, and for it to work inside Jupyter Notebooks, uh, we need to put in these two lines. Uh, there's a package called nest AsyncIO, and nest AsyncIO dot apply is what we need to run to allow PyDRA functions to operate inside a Jupyter Notebook. Okay. Uh, in PyDRA, we're using a, a significant amount of Python 3 features. Uh, so here we're using a decorator to convert a, a Python function to a PyDRA task. A PyDRA task is like a node in NiPipe 1. So we can construct a task uh, and it will have inputs uh, a equal to four and b equal to five. We can ask the type of the task and it says it's a function task. We can ask it to list the inputs. We can also check the entire inputs. And you can see that in addition to a and four, it actually stores a cloud pickled version of the function inside it. Uh, and this is what allows us to kind of send this function over to a different environment and execute it. Uh, to actually execute the task, you can call it like a Python function and it will run. And since again, this was a simple task that's adding two numbers, we're getting the output. Uh, 
you can access the result uh, through a result object. Uh, because it's cached, you can, it, it'll pick it up from its cache. You can get the result object itself out and explore properties of each result. So result.output.out. Uh, earlier you saw that result itself has multiple things. It has output information, runtime information, and error information. So now you can pull out different pieces of each result. Uh, you can also say uh, what inputs were given as part of your result, and it will tell you what inputs were given uh, as part of uh, creating the output. And this might be useful in certain contexts where you're scripting uh, over different kinds of things that you want to evaluate. So just like we could name things in NyPipe, you can customize your output names. The difference is we are leveraging Python 3 to be able to do it for arbitrary functions in Python. So you might import a function from scikit-learn or you might import a function from another Python library and they may not have named their outputs. Uh, so here, we, what we are asking, uh, since we are defining our own function, we can provide uh, information about how the output of the function should be named. So we are saying that the output of this function should be named sum underscore a underscore b. Uh, Python doesn't have a concept of naming outputs of functions, uh, but to use it in a data flow, we kind of need to know which piece of the output of a Python function and what its name is to connect it to other things. And so PyDRA allows this through standard Python 3 annotation syntax, which is what we're using here. Uh, but you can also uh, use it through a decorator called annotate. And this is what would allow you to use it on other Python functions that you are not defining in the script that you're writing. So when you import something else, you can use annotate and task to turn an arbitrary Python function into a PyDRA task. The order of PyDRA decorators is important. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the annotate has to come first and then you convert it to a task. Just like NyPipe, PyDRA has caching. So for any given task, you can ask for its output directory. You can list the contents of the output directory. And as you can see, there's something that stores information about the task and something that stores information about the result of a task. But you can set the output directory to a different location as well. So we're gonna create a temp cache directory. And we're gonna set the cache directory for this task. So we're gonna ask it to use this location for its cache directory. And if you ran the task, uh, this will take five seconds to run because we are simply asking it to sleep for five seconds to, and re then return the result. Uh, it stored it somewhere. So we can now check the output directory and you can see that this was set to the cache location that we had asked for and it has a certain signature that encodes the type of task that was run. Task 4a, uh, this is the same thing. It just picked up the results. It did not take five seconds because the result was cached, right? The thing that PyDRA adds on top of NyPipe is this idea of a set of cache locations. So here I'm creating another, th another task, but I'm giving it the, the location of my old cache and creating a new cache directory. And if I run it, uh, if it did not reuse the old cache, it would take five seconds to run because there's a sleep in this function. But it returns a result instantly because it can reuse the output that's in a different cache location. So the cache locations are read only. It uses things from there if it finds it there. If not, it'll run it and use it from, uh, from the local cache directory. So you can see if I now ask whether task 4b created its own output DIR, it says it does not exist. So now if I change the input to task 4b, it should re-execute because that cache does not exist. And it'll take five seconds. And it has its own output DIR as a result. So that's kind of the basic element of a task concept in PyDRA. Okay. 
I'm going to run through one other concept, which is this idea of splitting. So this is directly related to the iterables. Um, we again import nest async IO. We create a simple function which adds to, but I'm going to give it a list, which means it's going to fail because again, Python can't add lists. Uh, this was similar to the example I showed in NyPipe. But just like in NyPipe, we use the construct map node. Here in Pydra, we've uh, come to use the term split to say split this operation over the inputs of x. And when we do that, it, it will run that task over each of those values. So we can see that in the output over here, and we can see it if we ask it to return the outputs, uh, return the inputs alongside it, that for each value of x, it created an output. So this is a simple task uh, where the same thing was created uh, over different outputs. But this can be, again, just like NyPipe, extended to multiple inputs and split in multiple ways. So this is really a complex thing that can operate in a data flow at any level in Pydra. So here's an example where I've now changed the function to take two variables. And I'm going to give one variable as a list and split over that variable. And it will do the normal thing, which is to uh, run over the values of the variable. But I could also uh, have given it two different kinds of variables. And now this would not technically run because it does not know how to add list to list, right? Uh, but there are different ways of combining this. I can do pairwise comparison. so. Uh, uh, pairwise operations, one and 10 and two and 100, or different kinds of uh, combinations of this, one and 10, one and 100, two and 10, two and 100. And this introduces us, uh, gets us to the simple syntax that Pydra uses to do this. So we are using a tuple based syntax uh, to indicate this kind of scalar splitter operation. So let's do that. And this is taking each pair of things and running with it. But we can also do the output spl uh, outer splitter operation where we use brackets instead of parentheses to indicate that it should run all combinations of things. And when we do that, as expected, it runs the two by two combinations of things. What is nice about Pydra is that it allows you to do this at levels of complexity at any node or any task. So here is an example of uh, specifying a splitter which does pairwise things for x1, y1, and x2, and y2. That's the scalar pairing, but then does a combination of those two things across the outputs of those uh, scalar pairs. And just like NyPipe has a join node, Pydra uses the concept of a combiner to combine things back together. So here's an example of taking one and two, uh, splitting, so doing the outer product over A and B, and then combining only along the B dimension. So we can see that combined only sub pieces of it uh, because we asked it to combine across B. But we could also ask it to combine across A, which would be a slightly different way of combining the output. So if, if I look at this, the initial combination results are 11 and 101 for one of the branches and 12 and 102 for the other branch. If I combine the other way, you can see that it gets different ordering, 11 and 12, 101 and 102. You can also ask it to combine over everything. So this now combines over A and B in the order in which A and B were given. And this allows you to get things out for each task by combining different pieces of it. And while I'm demonstrating it over here at a specific task level, the same thing applies for workflows in Pydra. The last thing I want to show is parallel execution. So again, this task sleeps once, 
We are running four instances of this by splitting over, and it takes about roughly a little more than a second. But I can also ask it to specifically restrict the execution uh, to two processors. And if I do that, it should take longer because it now no longer has the ability to run all four tasks in parallel, and you can see that it takes longer. So this shows you how Hydra uses workers uh, and sets parameters of workers to run various things. So at this point, I'm gonna kind of stop. Uh, I'm gonna check if there are any more questions. So one of the questions is, are caches limited to complete workflows or are also available for individual steps in workflows? Uh, so this is the big difference between uh, Pydra and NiPipe. So in NiPipe, uh, workflow caches are unique to workflows and you would have to uh, run the same workflow to reuse a cache that's uh, created for its workflow. In Pydra, the caches are not just complete workflows, so they cache workflows, but they also cache individual tasks. So if any subtask was used by a different workflow, it would reuse the cache from workflow one. So a lot of the changes in Pydra are really, were really created to lift some of the bottlenecks of NiPipe. Uh, and so I would ask you to kind of play with it and see how uh, it fits into your needs, uh, but it provides some of the things in terms of caching that's significantly better. So if you are running a nested workflow and a nested step of the workflow took a long period of time, NiPipe would still check every single step of that workflow to make sure it did not need to be rerun. In Pydra, that nested workflow would be cached as a whole. And unless the inputs and the graph of that workflow changed, it won't rerun it and it would give you back the results of the workflow. So there's both workflow level caching and task level caching in Pydra. Is Pydra ready for prime time use, largely debugged, or is it in an alpha stage? I would say it's somewhere between alpha and beta. Uh, I think constructing workflows in Pydra would still require some debugging and interaction to figure things out. Uh, there is a demo application we've created. It's called Pydra ML uh, that you can use. What Pydra ML does is it creates a set of Python functions uh, to compare different machine learning algorithms from scikit-learn on a given data set. Uh, and then uh, does permutation testing, bootstrap cross-validation, and extracts uh, SHAP-based features on the models generated by things. And so it, it was created to uh, show the potential power of Pydra to split across different things, combine across different things, and generate caches. Again, it exists as a demo application because it works. Uh, I can't say that for every possible uh, workflow. And just like NiPipe, I think good Pydra workflow design will come into play. Uh, all I can say is that at this point in time, I would put it somewhere between alpha and beta. Uh, it runs, we use it. Uh, we also get into areas where we fix things. So uh, we would welcome kind of feedback if you use it, uh, but it does work in uh, a basic sense of using those workflows. Okay, uh, I will answer that live by telling you that uh, it, instead of a hyphen, it's an underscore for the NiPipe tutorial link. We'll fix it in the uh, slides. Is it possible to create task level caching for multiple multi-user setup? If my colleague ran some analysis with some configuration in his own set, I could still benefit from it. Uh, yes, in fact, that's exactly what Pydra was created to help do, which is if two people are running, let's say the same exact operation, you should be able to use each other's outputs. Um, so you should not have to rerun that and simply point your cache location to the other person and reuse that.
Ah, that's a good question. So in terms of pipelining and workflow packages, I would say it depends on what your use case is. If you're kind of using general purpose scientific computation, Hydra might be a better place to start uh, because it would support it. You're not uh, restricted to the neuroimaging packages. If you're doing something specific to neuroimaging, NiPipe would currently be a better place to start. If you are uh, able to spend some time working with us as we are moving things over, uh, we would welcome any feedback and help uh, in terms of transitioning NiPipe 1 to NiPipe 2 in terms of moving the tasks over. But I would say for neuroimaging workflows, NiPipe is the place to start. It's much more stable. It's much more debugged. Uh, it works. And so you should start there. We will provide mechanisms later on. Um, whereas Pydra is much more modern. And so it does a lot of other things quite nicely. And I would say it depends partly on the use cases that you would end up doing your workflow for. Yes, yeah, so Pydra is Python 3.7 plus, which means you have to be comfortable with the features of Python 3 and Python 3.7 plus uh, in terms of using Pydra workflows or creating Pydra workflows. Some aspects of it are easy to do. Uh, debugging uh, async IO can be a pain if you have never used async IO before. Uh, and that's a place where uh, you could run into issues. We're trying to simplify it again to catch any errors before you even construct the workflow. So validation uh, would happen before you even execute, uh, but that's not there yet. That's for the next release cycle. Okay, so I just, I, I know I'm over time. You can look at these slides later, but basically uh, much like many things, there are design and execution trade-offs. How do you parallelize which packages to use and how replicable do you want things to be? Because that would depend on whether pieces of your code are using uh, random seeds or not random seeds and understanding those components. So. It is a combination of the scientific question and operations that you want to do and the tools that you're going to use. And this is something you only have to decide on a application by application basis. And I would be happy to take these on at a offline state, which is kind of characteristics for designing good data flows and validating data flows. These are both topics that themselves are extensive discussions. In a standard Neuro Academy setting, we would have done this in, in a pub somewhere, uh, but these are things that we can take offline for other future Jitsi or Zoom calls. So with that, I'll stop sharing and uh, happy to take on any additional questions. Thanks, Seth. That was great. Uh, any questions? Folks should obviously feel welcome to ask uh, uh, in the Slack channel as well later. Uh, but if you have questions now, uh, feel free to ask. So I will answer one thing that was in the Zoom chat. Uh, what is the Cash. I'm assuming it, uh, so the, this might be a fundamental question, so I'm just going to clarify it. Uh, a cache in computer science is a place where some uh, state of a system is stored so that it can be reused for efficiency purposes. And in this particular case, for whether it's NiPipe or uh, Pydra, uh, the cache is the place on the file system where things are uh, executed. Uh, and so they can be reused when you rerun the workflows or in the case of Pydra, uh, when somebody else even points to your cache location. So think of it as I have run this task, I have the results, you don't need to run it again or I don't need to run it again if I'm running the same exact task again if the cache is safe. But it's a file system location in both cases for Pydra and uh, NiPipe.
Yes. So if you want to use Nightpipe, so Nightpipe is a meta wrapper on top of neuroimaging packages. Nightpipe itself has a set of algorithms inside it, but that's a very small subset of things to help uh, with certain pieces of processing. Uh, but in general, you need to have the other tools installed, which is why we have tools like NeuroDocker, which allow you to create containers uh, so that you don't have to pollute your own system if you have access to Docker or Singularity-based uh, uh, operations. But yes, to use Nightpipe, you need to have the underlying neuroimaging packages installed. You need to make sure their versions are compatible with Nightpipe. Uh, so Nightpipe will ensure that, except uh, so the good news for neuroimaging packages is that they don't change very rapidly. Uh, they do release, but they release in kind of bulk changes. And at this point, I think Nightpipe is caught up with all the different major packages. Uh, Nightpipe has a mechanism inside it, which uh, allows you to restrict a given interface to operate on a certain range of versions of an underlying package. So Nightpipe does that check for you in most cases. If there's a bleeding edge release, sometimes we get our act together and release an update prior to that. But sometimes that's done uh, within a few months after the release. I think there's a question on uh, yeah. what's the QAs. And yes, so I think Ariel has been posting them into the Slack channels after mm -hmm. the session is done. Yeah, there's actually, someone could potentially do a hackathon project on that because we're just dumping, uh, I think, JSON files with all the Q&As into, the, uh, into the, the Slack channels. Um, but I think that's true of all of them. Yeah, so go and, go and find them there and then you can parse them and, and uh, do whatever you want with them. Great. All right. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so um, let's all give Satra a round virtually. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess we'll call it quits here and then there'll be the next few talks in about 20 minutes. So thank you all. Thank you, Satra. Thanks, folks.